you're listening to Conversing the Classics. Today's topic is the Greek city-state, considered by many to be the intellectual hive of the ancient world. It is famed for being the birthplace of modern philosophy, democracy, literature and theatre. Joining me today to discuss the Greek city-state of Athens is Dr. Philip de Souza, senior lecturer in the UCD School of Classics. He's published a number of books on Greek history, including The Greeks at War, the Peloponnesian War and the Greek and Persian Wars, as well as teaching a module in UCD on family life in ancient Greece. Dr. D'Souza, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. So when we think about Athens, it is sort of, it is the Greek city of the ancient world. It is the one that most people will think of. What are the founding myths associated with Athens and where does it get its name? Well, Athens is clearly the city of Athena. Mm. And the patron goddess of the Athenians was the goddess Athena. She's the virgin goddess. She's a goddess of intellect and wisdom. She's also a goddess of war. Mm -hmm. And there was one myth which had it that the Athenians were offered a choice of patron deity between Athena and Poseidon, Mm. the brother of the god Zeus, and the god of the sea and also the god of earthquakes and the story goes that it became a competition and Poseidon struck a rock in the centre of Athens and produced a spring of fresh water Mm -hmm. which was of course a great gift to the Athenians but Athena the goddess of wisdom produced an olive tree on the same rock and showed the Athenians how the wood of the olive tree could be used and particularly how the olives could be used as food and olive oil could have many uses for eating, for cooking, for washing Mm. and olive oil became one of the main products of Athens and one of the foundations of the wealth of the Athenians. Mm -hmm. So you can see how the Athenians thought of themselves as being a city of intellectual people Mm. and as being an economic centre and as being not Mm. the city on the sea. Athens itself was some distance from the Mm. sea, but a city that subordinated the sea to its farming Mm. base. I see. So obviously it's about God, so there's not much truth behind it. (laughs) Depending, well, I don't think the Athenians would be too happy to hear you say that, but um, it's known as well, particularly as the birthplace of modern democracy. Does it establish itself or as a democracy from the get-go or does it take some time from its sort of its earliest dates? From the time that there's a substantial settlement on the site of Athens, which is in the second millennium BC, so in what people call the Mycenaean period, mm. the Bronze Age, to the founding of a democratic city-state, mm. you've got a period of over a thousand years. And the Athenians themselves had a tradition that they'd been ruled by kings. Mm. The most famous of those, although not their first king, was Theseus, Mm. the hero, the man who slays the Minotaur and who frees the Athenians from paying tribute of boys and girls to the great Cretan king Minos. Mm -hmm. So for a long time, the Athenians were ruled by kings At some point, the kings get supplanted by a group of aristocratic families, a kind of nobility. And it's not until the end of the 6th century BC that one aristocratic leader decides that in order to increase his own power and to defeat his aristocratic rivals, he will offer the ordinary citizens of Athens, the ordinary people, a more direct share in power and the running of the city. Mm. And so he comes up with the idea that the demos, the people, should be sharers in rule, arche, Mm. and from that you get democracy. Okay. And do we know what the name of the tyrant was, or is it just a tyrant? Well, what you have, in fact, you put in the the point that the Athenians had a period when they were ruled by not uh, hereditary kings, but by tyrants Mm -hmm. who had established themselves beyond the normal rivalries of the aristocratic families. And there was one particular tyrant, Pisistratus, Mm -hmm. whose rule seems to have been quite popular from the middle of of the 6th century BC. 
and whose family tried to continue a dynasty, but it was part of the overthrow of that dynasty that saw the aristocratic rivalry that produced Cleisthenes, Mm -hmm. the man who came up with the idea of sharing power more equally amongst the people of Athens, and that was the foundation of democracy in 509 BC. I see. And because it is feigned as this sort of, that it is where we get our democracy, our modern sense of democracy, how similar to our democracy was it? In some ways it was very similar because the idea was that any major decision should be the result of a democratic vote, that the citizens of Athens would choose whether or not they would go to war. They would choose whether or not they would have significant changes in the way their city was Mm. run. And the citizens of Athens would elect many of the people who were their officials and their important leaders, Mm. especially their generals, their war leaders. What makes it significantly different from, say, the democracy of the Irish Republic is that it was direct democracy Mm -hmm. rather than representative democracy. We elect TDs who form a doyle who then amongst themselves vote on things like laws. In Athens, all of the citizens voted directly on laws and on matters of government and policy. Mm -hmm. Also, they had a large number of small officials, groups of officials who ran things like the marketplace, who ran the funding of public festivals and things like the ordinary day-to-day political business, and they were appointed by lot from amongst the citizens rather than being people who had a salary and a long-term job. Mm. So they didn't have anything like the civil service. What they had was a lot of ordinary citizens taking it in turns to some extent to carry out many of the government activities. Mm -hmm. Now, they're a democracy, so obviously they are, by our definition, fair. They're a fair society. If you were convicted of a crime or committed a crime, how would you be tried? Did they have a judicial system? How did it work? The Athenians were actually quite famous for having a sophisticated judicial system that operated on the basis of jury courts. So people who were accused of something that was a significant crime could be put on trial and a jury of Athenian citizens would decide whether or not they were innocent or guilty. Athenian juries tended to be quite large, at least around 50 people, maybe 200. In some cases where a crime was particularly important and had political dimensions, juries might be as many as Mm 1,500. And they tried to have an odd number of people on the jury, say 201, Mm -hmm. so that there wouldn't be a tied vote. What was very different about their judicial system was that all trials had to take place within a day, often less than a day, because the same jury might hear several different cases, and the person who was prosecuting and the person who was defending with perhaps one or two helpers would have to make their own case. Mm -hmm. So they would have to speak directly to the jury. Mm -hmm. They couldn't hire a lawyer to do it for them. People tended to hire speech writers to create a persuasive speech, but you as the prosecutor or you as the defendant had to persuade that jury on that day of guilt or innocence. I see. Now, moving again back to the notion that it is this fair democracy, there obviously would have to be a an upper and a lower class or a Uh, an upper and a working class. What was the divide between rich and poor like in Athens? It's hard to be precise about this because, relatively speaking, not that many people would be considered very rich in Athens. It was a city-state on a fairly large territory, but it was essentially one large city and a surrounding countryside with some smaller towns and villages in it. So the overall scale of it is quite small. Mm. In being a pre-industrial society, 
the opportunities to get very rich were also limited to what you could generate from surplus agricultural produce, from trade, and from maybe some other things like mining or selling commodities, selling people. It was a slave society mm. as well. Therefore, the rich people in Athens were richer, mm. but they weren't really what we might consider, let's say, the billionaires or the excessively wealthy aristocrats mm. of, say, 19th century Britain and Ireland. That said, at the other end of the scale, the very poorest people would have been farmers with a very small amount of not very good land, scraping a living on a very subsistence level mm. and struggling almost from day to day to survive. Mm. And there were plenty of people in Athens who didn't even have that much because it was a slave owning society mm. and there were plenty of people who literally had nothing they didn't even own their own bodies mm. and then that brings us nicely into the next question what was the ratio of slaves to free men or citizens i suppose you could call them in this case in classical athens scholars are still trying to work that one out mm. because there's no census records there's no detailed information about how many people there were there are a few figures in ancient literature that suggest how many citizens there might have been, but that's freeborn citizen male Athenians doesn't usually include the number of women and children mm. and does not include people who live in Athens but were born elsewhere, so resident foreigners and we have no figures of any kind for the numbers of slaves. Modern estimates suggest that at its height, in the late 5th century, Athens may have had as many as 60,000 citizen men. Mm -hmm. But how many slaves might there have been? That, that's guesswork. Mm. The best guesses that I've seen range between 100,000 and 200,000 slaves. Okay. So there are more slaves probably yeah. than citizen men, but if you expect the average citizen male to have at least one wife and at least two children, then you would expect there in total to be more free citizens and other free people mm -hmm. than slaves. I see. Now, you mentioned there that obviously male citizens, I think that's, that's the emphasis that you have to be male to be a citizen. What would life be like for women and children in Athens? Hard work. Because most people in Athens were either living directly off the land and so were involved in farming, farming grain, farming cereal crops, farming olives, cultivating vines and having small animals, some sheep, some cattle. So a lot of it is focused on farm work and that requires the participation of every able-bodied person. Mm -hmm. So it's likely that the ordinary people of Athens, the women and the children, as soon as they were old enough, would have been participating in farming. Mm -hmm. Or if the family is one that's involved in a trade, say making shoes or making pottery or metalworking or something like that, you would expect again the whole household to be involved to some extent. Yeah. However, it was considered to be socially desirable for Athenian women not to have to go out of their household and conduct business on a regular basis mm -hmm. and the wealthier families were the more likely it would be that wives and younger daughters would probably have their focus on doing tasks in the home mm -hmm. that doesn't mean that they've not got other work to do mm -hmm. a great deal of the day-to-day -day activity of women in Athens was probably around what we might call the textile mm. industry, but it's very much a cottage industry. There's lots of evidence, both written and pictorial evidence, you get lots of painted pottery from classical Athens that shows that women are involved in spinning wool, 
in weaving cloth, in cleaning wool, in carding wool, in dyeing textiles, wool and linen. And this would be for themselves, for their family, for immediate use, but also probably in some of the larger households, to some extent that would be a productive commercial activity. Mm. Then there's also food preparation, food storage. A lot of that is considered to be women's work in Athenian households. Mm. There's plenty of evidence to suggest that in the farms and the villages outside of the city of Athens, a lot of the time the women and the older children would be involved in agricultural mm. work. The children themselves, probably from at least the age of seven, would have small chores to do and would be learning to do what their parents did. So, again, lots of agricultural work, but if your father's a shoemaker, then yeah. from probably about the age of seven, you're starting to learn how to work with leather and to make shoes. Yeah. And also, because the Athenians liked to have as many children as possible, mm. older children would need to be helping to look after younger children. Mm -hmm. I see. So you mentioned there that if you if your father was a shoemaker or if he was a farmer, you would be helping on the farm. So obviously education, I suppose, more so in our sense, was something that was held for the richer people. What we tend to think of as education is formal education. Mm -hmm. Things like learning to read and write, learning basic numeracy, mm -hmm. learning music and maybe learning athletics and that sort of thing. Yeah. That was all done in classical Athens but it wasn't considered essential, particularly amongst the poorer citizens. Mm. So there were no state schools. Yeah. There was no requirement for formal education. And from what we can tell, even amongst the wealthier citizens, the question of how much you needed to learn would be dependent on what kind of social status your family had and what they thought their cultural obligations were. Mm. Clearly, there were people who were paid to teach boys and girls basic numeracy and literacy. And for boys in particular, amongst the wealthier citizens, they would be expected to learn Homeric poetry. They would be expected to learn the principles of oratory, of persuasive public speaking. They would also be expected to learn musical instruments. But... How far you could go with that would be dependent on the wealth your family had available mm. because you're either hiring private tutors or you're sending your child to a small private school run by others. OK. Now, this huge... Well, it is quite a big city. It is one of the prominent ones in Greece. It obviously needs a defence force. How did it structure its military? The Athenians worked on the basis that the people who most needed to protect their city were the citizens themselves. And so the basis of an Athenian army was the Athenian male citizens. Mm. It was an obligation for all Athenian male citizens to take part in the defence of the city. They wouldn't necessarily be trained on a regular basis, mm. but certainly those who had a reasonable level of wealth would be expected to either have their own arms and armour or be able to use arms and armour provided by the state. Now, that might boil down to just a spear, a shield, and maybe a helmet. Mm -hmm. There's a traditional view of Greek soldiers as having lots of bronze body armour and having elaborate helmets and so on. But what we can see in, again, particularly the pictorial representation, sculpture and vase painting, suggests that the ordinary soldier was somebody who could mm -hmm. use a spear and a shield. But the Athenians had a large number of people in their population who weren't even wealthy enough for that basic equipment. Mm -hmm. And particularly from the early 5th century BC down towards the end of the 4th century BC, the Athenians have large fleets of warships that are used for external military operations and the acquisition and maintenance of an external maritime empire. Mm. And lots of Athenians would carry very small amounts of equipment, maybe a knife, 
a few javelins or a sling mm. and might row ships with other Athenians to take part in military expeditions overseas as what the military historians would call light infantry. OK. Now, just now that we have the, the military side covered a little bit, we do need to talk about what a- Athens did in warfare. Particularly in the 5th century BC, Athens plays a key role in the defence of Greece against the invading Persian Empire. Why is it that a small city-state like Athens was able to take on, and I obviously have to add defeat, the forces of an empire that ruled pretty much the entirety of the Eastern world? The simple answer is they had no choice because the Persians attacked them. Yeah. So the Athenians had to either surrender and accept the authority of the Persian king or make a stand. When they first decide to do that, it's actually to help Greeks on the other side of the Aegean Sea, the cities and the small islands off the coast of what is now Western Turkey, had a close kinship with the Athenians. They called themselves Ionians Mm. and recognised Athens as in some sense their mother city. Mm. A lot of these came under Persian rule in the middle of the 6th century BC and at the beginning of the 5th century, 499 BC, a lot of them decided to revolt against the Persian king and they asked other Greeks for help and essentially it was the Athenians who gave them some assistance. Mm. That revolt was unsuccessful and after five years it was crushed by the forces of the Persian king. The Persian king then decided to send a punitive expedition against the Athenians that landed at the Bay of Marathon on the northeast coast of Attica, the region of Athens, Mm -hmm. and was going to march on the city of Athens. But the Athenians assembled their whole citizen army, Mm -hmm. about 9,000 heavy infantry soldiers and probably twice as many light infantrymen. They got some help from the nearby smaller city-state of Plataea, Mm -hmm. They faced down the Persian army on the plain of Marathon for several days and eventually defeated them in a battle. Now, the Athenians were amazed to have won because they thought, we're a small city-state and this is the great Persian Empire. The difference in the size of the armies was probably not that great. Mm. This was, a, if you like, an expedition against the Athenians by the Persian king. But ten years later, the son of that Persian king... Xerxes decided to launch a full invasion to crush all of the Greek city-states and he brought hundreds of thousands of men and over a thousand ships. He marched uh, from northern Asia Minor through what is now the northern parts of Greece in through Macedonia, subduing or accepting the surrender of the various cities and communities there And it wasn't until he got as far as Athens that there was a major military resistance, not actually led by the Athenians. The Greeks preferred to have the Spartans to lead them, but the Athenians contributed a lot of soldiers and they also contributed a lot of ships to try and defeat the Persian king's fleet so that it couldn't be used to outmaneuver the Greeks. Mm. And in two major battles... A sea battle off the island of Salamis in 480 BC and a land battle the following year at Plataea, just north of Athens, in 479 BC. Mm. The combined Greek forces defeated the Persians. The Athenians played a leading role in that, particularly the sea battle, but they were not the official commanders of it. It was Mm. a Spartan leadership. Mm. But the Athenians got a substantial military reputation from that and they realised also that although they were a city-state they were one of the larger ones and they had enough military power to take on the Persian Empire. Okay now so they win this astounding victory I mean it really is sort of against the odds when you look at it. After the Greco-Persian Wars is when Athens really begins to establish itself as sort of the intellectual hive for new ideas with characters such as Socrates establishing the basis of modern philosophy, Pericles building the Parthenon, which we'll talk about in just a moment. Even the historian Herodotus is said to have spent some time in Athens. Why did this sort of, I suppose, ancient renaissance occur? 
it's clearly tied up with the fact that Athens has become quite a powerful and quite a wealthy city-state within the Greek world. The territory that Athens controlled, Attica, is a large peninsula on the sort of southeastern side of mm. Greece. It was quite productive, particularly for olives and for vines. The Athenians discovered some quite rich veins of silver that they could mine, so they could, through trade, make themselves wealthy. They had a largish population, and they were prepared not just to defend themselves, but to be aggressive and to start to dominate other Greek states. They created a maritime empire using their fleets of warships to subdue or to draw into alliance the smaller city-states on some of the islands of the Aegean and some of the cities around the northern and eastern coasts of the Aegean Sea. And they created what historians call the Athenian Empire, mm. which was a kind of alliance to begin with of smaller city-states that were looking to Athens for help and protection against the Persians, mm. but which turned into an empire dominated by the Athenians, with most of these other Greeks mm. paying tribute to the Athenians mm. to finance the military activities and also just to make the Athenians wealthier. I see. Now, I mentioned earlier in that question about Pericles and the building of the Parthenon, which is one of the buildings on the Acropolis. Again, we'll come back to that in a moment. Why is it that the Acropolis is built, this sort of beautiful hilltop shrine, I suppose, is a good way to put it, or a collection of buildings? Simple answer to that is because they could. Because the Athenians had the money, they had the artistic and creative talents to design and build a complex of shrines and temples that were on a very large scale. The Parthenon was one of the largest temples in the ancient world and were also conceived of as being impressive for their beauty and their scale to reflect the way the Athenians thought about themselves. They thought about themselves and their patron gods and goddesses on an impressive scale. Why on the Acropolis? Because it's the central defensible area in the city of Athens. It had for hundreds of years been the focus of religious cults and there were already shrines to Athena, mm. to Poseidon and to other deities there. Mm. And there was a, if you like, a cultural confidence in Athens, certainly around the middle of the 5th mm -hmm. century BC, which expresses itself in monumental building, mm -hmm. and monumental building that was of a kind that the Greeks had hardly ever seen before. Mm -hmm. You mentioned there that the Parthenon was one of the biggest temples in the ancient world, and the Acropolis obviously was a complex of temples. I suppose they are the richest state, but even then, how did they manage to push so much money into financing a project as big as this? That's where direct democracy becomes quite significant. Pericles, who comes to prominence as a leading politician in the middle of the 5th century BC, seems to have persuaded the Athenians that this was something they wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And as a group, the however many thousand Athenian citizens voted to use state funds for these building projects mm. because they would be honouring their gods, but also they would be honouring and increasing their own prestige mm. as a, a citizen body. Mm. We know that some of the money came from the state revenues for things like the hiring out of rights to silver mines, also from collecting harbour taxes. Athens had become a major trading centre, so people were bringing their stuff to Athens to sell it, mm -hmm. and the Athenian state was making profits on that through harbour taxes and through sales taxes. But some of it also appears to have been money that came to them from their subject allies mm -hmm. in the Athenian Empire. And some of these people complained 
that the Athenians were making their city rich and beautiful looking at the expense of their allies. I see. Now, costs so much money and it's all sort of may or mainly in honour of the goddess Athena. She's the virgin goddess. Parthenon, if I'm right, is the Greek word for virgin. And it's so it's ded dedicated to Athena. Now, a key date in the Athenian calendar is the Panathenaic procession. What is this ceremony and how does it tie into the Acropolis? The Panathenaic procession or the Panathenaic festival is a festival for the worship of Athena, which is centered on Athens, but is open to other cities and communities who recognize Athena as a patron goddess. And it's focused on the Acropolis because, as you say, the what we think of as the Parthenon is the temple of Athena the Parthenos, Athena the Virgin. And it's not actually in that temple that they have the focus of the festival. There was another temple nearby or a little complex of shrines that's usually called the Erechtheon because one of the deities worshipped there was Erechtheus. Mm. But in that temple they displayed a cult statue of Athena, the goddess of the city, and every year they would make and present to her an elaborate kind of veil or cloak. Every four years they would have a super festival inviting people from across the Greek world to participate in the procession to give the goddess mm. her new veil and they would have sacrifices, they would have athletic competitions, poetic competitions, musical competitions mm. in honour of their goddess. It's a combination of a religious celebration and a city and community festival. Okay. Now, I'm sorry to have to push things along, but we need to get through nearly 500 years of history in just under about 45 minutes. So I'm going to push on to the next, one of the next key moments in uh, Greek history, and that is Alexander and the Hellenistic Age. What happens to Athens and in Athens under Alexander and then moving on into the Hellenistic era? In the middle of the 4th century BC, the Athenians are struggling to maintain any kind of an empire. They had a major war with the Spartans at the end of the fourth, at the end of the fifth century BC, which resulted in their defeat and the dismantling of their maritime empire. They tried to revive this to some extent, from about 394 to about 350 BC, but they are less successful, and a new political power emerges in northern Greece, Philip II, King of Macedon who is able to defeat the smaller Greek city-states with his combined Macedonian army. He's the father of Alexander the Great. When Philip is assassinated in 336 BC, the Greek city-states think they can easily deal with his very young son, Alexander. They find out that they can't. Alexander launches a swift military operation that defeats a combined Greek army near the city of Thebes. He punishes the city of Thebes for its revolt by destroying it completely. The Athenians, who are allies of the Thebans, are forced to surrender. Politicians from Athens who'd opposed Alexander are either executed or flee into exile. And the Athenians, along with most of the major Greek city-states, become, if you like, subordinate allies of the Macedonian king. The Macedonian king initially is Alexander, who leads a huge invasion of the Persian Empire and conquers that. When he dies, his vast empire breaks up into different parts, headed by various generals who'd mm. been part of his army. And Athens, in the age after Alexander, which is known as the Hellenistic Age, becomes subordinate to the ruling kings of Macedon, mm. who are a dynasty established by one of Alexander's generals. Mm. Athens continues to be quite an important cultural centre, and it has some degree of political autonomy, but it is 
for a long time subject to the overall control of the Macedonian kings. I see. Now, pushing things on about another hundred or so years, <laughs> when and how does Athens become part of the Roman Empire? At the end of the 3rd century BC, while the Romans are fighting against the Carthaginians and Hannibal has a Carthaginian army rampaging around Italy, the current Macedonian king, Philip V, decides it would be a good opportunity to make sure that the Romans don't have any influence in mainland Greece by making an alliance with Hannibal that Hannibal will help keep the Romans in Italy and Philip V will, in some sense, help keep them out of Greece and help distract the Romans and help the Carthaginians win their war. Mm. The Romans intercept envoys between Philip V and Hannibal, discover what's going on, are extremely upset about this and declare war on the King of Macedon. That war comes to a an inconclusive end but once Hannibal has been defeated and the Carthaginians have surrendered to the Romans in 202 BC the Romans decide that it's time to do something about the king of Macedon mm. and they start another war with Macedon that ends in Philip V's defeat mm. and his recognition of the authority of Rome mm. his son Perseus tries to overthrow the Romans or prevent the Romans from having authority in Greece. So the Romans have another war with the Macedonians and that ends in the complete defeat of Macedon mm -hmm. and the establishment of a Roman province in Macedonia, which puts the Romans in the position of dominating the Greek cities. Mm. By the middle of the second century BC, that domination has become very unpopular and some of the Greek city-states try to overthrow Roman control. They fail. The Romans defeat a combined Greek army, which includes an Athenian element to it. And in 146 BC, the Romans sack and destroy the ancient Greek city of Corinth. Mm in the same year, in fact, in which they also destroyed the city of Carthage. Mm. And it's really from 146 BC that Athens is effectively one of the Greek city-states that are now part of the Roman Empire. Okay. So, we've actually quite efficiently got through a lot of history in a very short space of time. To sum everything up, what are the three most important things you'd like people to remember about ancient Athens? One thing to remember about Athens, it was, it was a city-state. Mm. It was a large city with a large territory around it, but it wasn't that big in terms of what we would think of as states nowadays. There were a few hundred thousand people mm. living in the Athenian city-state, and within that group, only a limited number of them had actual citizenship, and within that group only the adult males had political rights and could participate in the running of their city. Mm -hmm. And that's what it meant to be in a city-state. Secondly, it was a pre-industrial city-state. So although it possessed many beautiful buildings, mm -hmm. it was probably a very dirty, smelly and unhealthy place. Mm -hmm. There was no great public sanitation. Mm -hmm. There were no public sewers. It was a dangerous and unhealthy place mm. in our terms. And because of the low levels of sanitation, there was a low level of life expectancy. Even adults would, on average, not expect to live beyond about 45 years if they were men and about 35 years if they were women. Mm. So it was a city-state full of young people. What you might call the age profile of ancient Athens was, by our standards, very, very young. Mm. Third thing to take away, I suppose, is that it was an amazingly vibrant culture. Mm. These relatively young people living in this pre-industrial city-state created 
modern drama. Mm. Athens is the birthplace of tragedy. It's also the birthplace of comedy, political comedy and satire and romantic comedy can all be traced back to plays performed at Athenian festivals. It was, as you pointed out, very much the birthplace of modern philosophy, particularly what we would tend to call ethical philosophy. Socrates and his pupil Plato. Plato founded a kind of philosophical academy and then a Macedonian called Aristotle came and settled in Athens and founded another philosophical academy and a very kind of scientific version of philosophy grows mm. up there and political history really has its origin in Athens. So does the art of writing law court speeches and there's a great focus of arts and literature out of this relatively small pre-industrial city-state. Okay. And that brings us really nicely to the end of the podcast. Dr. D'Souza, thank you so much for joining me today and giving us such a fantastic overview of 500 years of history in 40 minutes. Thank uh, you. <laughs> if you enjoyed today's podcast and want to find out more or get involved with Classical Youth Society of Ireland, you can contact us via our social media pages on www.facebook.com forward slash Classical Youth Society Ireland. You can follow us on Twitter at CYSI underscore or for any direct inquiries, you can email us at cysiofficial at gmail.com also if you want to check out any of Dr D'Souza's books which I mentioned in the introduction they will all be down below in the description today's podcast was edited by Michael Fuller I hope you enjoyed and I'll catch you all next time <laughs> <laughs>